Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my topic for today is uh, tissue plasminogen activator in retinal practice. So um, TPA or tissue plasminogen activator is a naturally occurring serine protease. Uh, the major enzymatic action of TPA is the conversion of uh, plasminogen into plasmin, an active serine protease that hydrolyzes fibrin. Uh, fibrin forms a ternary complex with uh, TPA and plasminogen, which increases um, the rate of plasminogen activator several hundred folds. And this is a pictographic representation of, of how the TPA works. Uh, the commercially available tissue plasminogen activator to our availability is alteplase, um, tenecteplase, and reteplase. Now there have been multiple papers uh, published regarding the use of TPA in the, in the eye, uh, starting from as early as 2005. Uh, some of them have used it, it in uh, submacular uh, hemorrhage, combining with subretinal air or combining it with a cocktail of sub uh, submacular air and anti uh, one of the One of the studies came from RP Center early on, eight years back. So it's pretty much well established that uh, uh, what are the usual indications of TPA, but uh, there still exists um, a tendency to avoid the use of uh, TPA because of two major um, rate limiting factors. First is the cost factor and second is the steep learning curve factor and this instruction course uh, tends to alleviate sort of those two factors to help you incorporate TPA in a much better and a hassle free way. So to understand that what we have to understand is that what are the TPAs available currently with us. So amongst the uh, four TPAs, uh, Alteplase, tenecteplase, and reteplase are the available modalities, amongst which tenecteplase is the highest, um, um, it has the highest, uh, um, highest selectivity, and reteplase is a relatively lesser selective uh, alternative of TPA. But when we are dealing with a small amount of hemorrhage, such as a submacular hemorrhage, which in comparison to a blood clot in the, in the vessels is a small amount, no matter how massive it is, then this specificity doesn't matter. So a tenecteplase would be expensive to use uh, when we are practically throwing away 99.99% of the drug. So a better alternative is to use a reteplase. Now reteplase um, comes uh, in a box which has two vials, so it can also allow you for um, you know a sequential using in two different pa patients from the same from the same box that you have purchased. It will cut down your cost to literally one third or one fourth of what tenecteplase is all about. I'll be discussing that later. So the roots of TP administration is intravitreal. Uh, it is used usually in submacular bleed in conjunction with a pneumatic displacement with a dosage of 50 to 100 micrograms per 0.1 ml. The rationale is that, is that it increases the chances at, at resolution by inducing clot dissolution um, and it uh, uh, reduces the adhesion of the clot. So when we, an, uh, when we uh, go through the papers that have been published on analyzing the forces acting upon a submacular hemorrhage, what we know is that the uh, bowency and the gravity, they cancel each other out and that's how the submacular hemorrhage it is stationary. So in a non-vitrectomized eye, when we uh, put gas, uh, then the interface changes to that of a uh, blood gas interface and hence the bowency caused by it is lesser than the gravity. Um, so in a non-vitrectomized eye, we have to position the eye such that the interface is that of a gas blood interface rather than, a th than that of a gas, uh, than, th than that of a blood uh, vitreous interface. And that is how the bowency force uh, becomes much lesser and the blood gravitates down. But then for this to happen, the clot has to be mobile, adhesion prevention uh, um, has to happen, and the cl I mean the cl clot has to liquefy because the um, liquefied clot has a slightly greater density than that of intraocular fluid. So here is where the role of TPA comes in. Utilizing this uh, method of treatment, I treated a 75 year old male with a submacular bleed secondary to a PCV with blunt trauma. And this was the preoperative fundus picture. And the OCT showed something like this. The plan was intravitreal TPA with brolicizumab with a C3A8 gas tamponade followed by two monthly intravital brolicizumab under TPA, uh, sorry, under, under TA. And post first dose, there was near total resolution of blood as well as edema. And post third dose, the uh, OCT cleared off to give uh, a very clear near normal anatomical structure with a DCV of six by nine parts from a hand movements close to face. And this was the fundus picture at the end of three months. Now, uh, 
Uh, Intravitreal use is a relatively simpler route of administration, but the outcome, of course, is unpredictable due to multifactorial causes that also have been published with vis-a-vis -vis its penetrability, etc. So a more specific use is a subretinal use, and this is where the entire uh, roadblocks come into play because any given day, this has a much more selective, specific, and a, a very uh, nearly 100% rate of acting. The rationale being it bypasses the retinal barrier and acts on the clot directly. And secondarily, the mechanical displacement of heme away from the fovea within the subretinal drug bubble also helps to clear out the uh, blood away from the fovea. The dosage uh, that I use is uh, 25, 30 micrograms per 0.1 ml. Uh, the entire concern of this uh, method is a controlled subretinal microdose delivery and the cost factor. These are the two main reasons why we see multiple papers which are trying to obviate the need of use of either use of TPA or the use of a subretinal TPA. So the need of the R is to basically have a risk-free flattening of a seemingly steep learning curve, thereby significantly improving the chances of a good anatomical and functional outcome of a frequently encountered problem. And this is why I employ uh, this method. This is a, s uh, this is a microdose injector made by Med1, no financial interest. And I use uh, Med1's 38 gauge uh, straight tip uh, needle, a cannula. This is fit to uh, the silicon oil plunger of a constellation machine. And with this, I put the infusion pressure at 10 to 12, the injection pressure to 10 to 12. With that, with this, what I do is I transfer the control of the subretinal bubble sp uh, formation speed from my hand to the foot pedal. And that is also not having a learning curve of how fast I press the pedal or uh, how slow I press the pedal. Once I put it to 12 and I have a full throttle on the foot pedal, even then with the full throttle, this is the speed, uh, the rate at which the towel is getting wet. This is the speed at which the TPA gets injected with a full throttle of foot pedal with a 10 to 12 pressure. So when I employ this, the entire learning curve goes for a toss. And regarding the cost factor, if we purchase a Tenec place, there are two, uh, two packages for it, 40 mg and 30 mg. Considering we're using at max 100 micrograms, 30 mg will work fine, but even 30 mg will cost you between 20 to 25,000 rupees. But a re place will come in for 15,000 rupees. It has two vials, so the per vial will cost you 7.5,000 rupees. And a microdose injector, will cost you around 2,000 rupees. So even if you don't reuse it, firstly it is reusable it, if you will ETO it, but even if you do not reuse it, even then per injection with the cannula will co and the uh, microdose injector is reusable. So even with the um, non-reusable things with a fresh vial, um, the recurring cost would just be 9.5 thousand rupees. So it eliminates the cost factor and it also eliminates the learning curve. So my case two is to show just that. This is a case of a post-traumatic sub uh, vitreous bleed with a submacular bleed. So after doing a, a core and a peripheral, I went ahead with a 360 degree laser. And then with a 38 gauge, just pierce it, just tilt it a bit horizontal and press the foot pedal full throttle. It will be a very slow, gradual formation, no risk of rips or hole formation, etc., and just do a fax with gas and you're done. No need to put submacular anti-VEGF because anti-VEGF can be put intravitrally also after a PPV works just fine. Uh, so post third week, this was the post-op, um, uh, the bleed had cleared, uh, showed uh, colloidal scarring due to trauma, pre-operative uh, OCT, which was uh, having a finger counting close to face, improved to uh, an OCT that looked like this, Slight ISOS discontinuity, but I was happy with the anatomical restoration of it. BCVA improved to a five by 60. My, uh, we can also use it intraoperatively, wherein after, a, in this case, after a segmental buckle, uh, in a case of RD, I did not feel the need to, uh, okay, now there are two things to it. A, I didn't need to create a retinotomy or a uh, break to drain it. And also, I don't have any threshold of treating the submacular bleed because all the thresholds that I have read about in the published articles, um, I believe that if given a choice and if the risk-free flattening is there of the learning curve, I, I would say that for a m better chance at anatomical recovery, 
if given a choice of uh, risk free intervention i would go for a submacular injection even in the smallest of cases so in this case uh, after the liquefaction of the blood the blood has settled down inferiorly intraoperatively there is no retinotomy made for the evacuation of the blood um, and then laser and oil injection is done as usual and the oil was injected, yeah. So six weeks follow up, BCVA was three by 60, uh, IOP controlled, adequate oil fill, post SOR BCVA was six by 60 with controlled IOP on anti-glaucoma. So a few more examples, a uh, post-traumatic submacular, but in this also we have, we know that we see a lot of uh, uh, videos about uh, draining a, a large submacular bleed uh, by making an adjacent retinectomy or a large hydrogenic GRT to evacuate the bleed. Now, it's not this, this bleed is not that large a bleed, but I used uh, the TPA in this case to uh, try and see if something called as a subretinal lavage that I think uh, uh, will be the way forward. In this case, what I did was there was an infrotemporal retinotomy, a small retinotomy, the way we, we, we make to drain the SRF was made, and then a TPA was injected superiorly. It liquefied the blood and the blood, whatever had to, whatever excess blood had to be evacuated, it evacuated through the retinotomy and the residual blood, if was not coming out, settled inferiorly. So no big break was formed, laser it, leave it in gas and the recovery was just fine. The, the patient improved to a six by 36. So this is something uh, that I did. Uh, I call it the subretinal TPL lavage. This is a case of a post-traumatic sub-papillomacular bundle bleed where again we see the bleed amount is very small but that's what I said like if I remove the learning curve of it uh, I would be tempted to intervene surgically for a rapid resolution even in small bleeds if it is involving a critical um, anatomical landmark like a papillomacular bundle in this case the vision improved from a finger counting to a 624 pass at one month. This is again a CNVM, uh, regular CNVM case with a submacular bleed treated with uh, subretinal TPA. Uh, one month post-op revealed six by 18 parts. Now this was a new and old submacular bleed in this case. There was a post-traumatic case uh, with a post-traumatic bleed, not treated, formed a choroidal rupture was there underneath, formed a secondary CNVM, re-bled again. In this case, the secondary rationale where we inject and the uh, bleed gets mechanic. Uh, I mean, the uh, clotted blood and the fresh bleed also gets mechanically displaced, um, comes into picture, and we also achieved a very satisfactory uh, anatomical improvement um, uh, with this modality. Um, now, there's a non-hemorrhagic use that I stumbled upon accidentally, where uh, in a case of when I used an intravitreal TPA and the blood did not resolve, when I went in for a PPV, I found the vitreous to be liquefied enough and the PVD to have happened. So this led me to think because of the proteolytic action, can I use this in taut ERMs? Now there is, uh, it has to be pretty subjective, of course I know, uh, but just going by uh, the look of it, if I see an ERM like this, I would think it to be taut with a broad attachment with a very broad lift up. In these cases, what I do is I inject the TPA 24 hours prior to planning an ERM removal. And this is an unedited video just to show the ease and the speed and the uh, lift of uh, ERM. Um, this is how tight the ERM looked, but when I tried to pull it off without almost any traction on the retina, it simply lifted off like this from the macula. So, um, in my thought process, I think that this can also be a future of TPA use where we can use it in non-hemorrhagic cases such as uh, epiretinal membrane, taut epiretinal membrane as to, of course, studies have to, have to be done to define uh, which is a taut TRM, how do you say it's a taut TRM, et cetera, et cetera. But just by clinical observation, if we feel like we can always go in for a rationale of giving a preoperative TPA followed by an ERM removal. Thank you. Um, any questions uh, from anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, so currently, I have done a uh, seven seven cases. Yeah. Uh, 
sir, uh, sir, there has been no literature support for this. Uh, that is why it made me think out of the box. The literature support has been of a non-enzymatic vitrolysis and all of that which has been tried, tested, and not worked. Uh, but th th again, sir, I, this was a serendipity when I, when I did it. And I, the intravital TPFA, lysa, as I said, I found the vitreous to be pretty liquefied. So that's where I thought in the lines of probably it may loosen up. It may not cause a complete ERM removal. So I I'm not uh, having it as a non-surgical alternative. It is a pre-surgical, uh, um, I mean, um, adjunct, yeah, to ease the, ease the removal of ERM. So it basically acts like an alcohol for a PRK. Like what we do for a PRK, we put alcohol in the epithelium, this comes off. This may act like a TPA as an alcohol for uh, uh, TPA acting as a alcohol uh, for yeah, ERM. Sir. So OCT didn't change. It did not have a detachment. I mean, uh, the ERM did not get resolved. No, sir, no separation. Uh, sir, that is what exactly I was talking about. Like that analysis has just been seven cases old that I have done this and I have not evaluated it, 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 it in that extent, but that is the future line of uh, thought process that is going on. Probably, yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's an open vista. Uh, uh, there, is, there, is, there is no research done on this, on these lines. And it can have it. This can serve us, and maybe all of us can collaborate and get a paper. Uh, so, Dr. Boral, we can do it. Uh, <laughs> so, I now invite uh, Dr. Anirudh Mathi to give his uh, talk. Um, I would respect. Uh, I, I would. I, I would request Dr. Devesh to just take over the uh, emceeing of this uh, IC just for 10 minutes because I have another session of two minutes to win. So I'll just come back in 10 minutes. Uh, till then, just, uh, uh, sir, uh, you and all the participants, if you can um, just carry forward. Okay. Thank you, Bibhuti, uh, for this opportunity. Well, I will be, uh, uh, already Dr. Bibhuti has uh, described all about TPA. So I will go the opposite way, like the main indication is a macular hemorrhage. So if we see that uh, the reasons for the submacular hemorrhage, the CNVM, PCV, and RAM, th these are the main uh, causes where the submacular hemorrhage uh, occurs. And the PCV is the most commonly uh, associated with a large uh, submacular hemorrhage. And why is it so important to treat so early? Because it causes an irreversible retinal injury as early as 24 hours. So most uh, rapidly it has been diagnosed and early intervention is done, the results are better. Because uh, it has been seen that there is a gross deterioration of vision if it is left untreated. And definitely we need to treat the underlying cause as well. So we are not going to do the diagnosis. Treatment options are many. It's some macular hemorrhage. Sometimes uh, it can be treated with only anti also. Pneumatic displacement with anti of without anti of only uh, the mm, uh, C3F8 and anti of and TPA with anti of uh, that is an option. And obviously the last is uh, subretinal TPA, intervitreal TPA and subretinal TPA. So we will go one by one case scenario. This is like, uh, as, as, as I was mentioning, some hemorrhage might not be that large and the thickness of blood may be less than 450 microns. In those cases, actually, we can try with the anti as well. Here in this case, you can see the presenting visual acuity was uh, finger counting two feet. And with anti loading dose, it improved to 660. Now, the next scenario is like it's a RAM bleeding. And it was uh, treated with pneumatic displacement, RTPA. anti I had given because there was a macular edema. We might not give anti uh, for a RAM. And uh, what happened is following the intervitreal TPA, there was a breakthrough hemorrhage, which can happen. We need to, uh, when we are uh, giving RTPA either intervitreally or subretinally, we need to counsel the patient that this, you might have a breakthrough bleeding. This is uh, pretty common and the patient should be counseled before proceeding with the, pro uh, proceeding the operation. 
So once this breakthrough bleeding happened, we, we had to take uh, for the uh, vitrectomy and I'll just, sorry, I you can see the dense hemorrhage is there. You can see the gas was still there. Uh, the tampon had was still there. If you don't counsel the patient, the patient will go to another uh, other surgeon. <laughs> but the good part is uh, sometimes the breakthrough bleeding, especially in RAM, it's good in a sense you can actually take out all the blood <laughs> and uh, it, the blood becomes more approachable and can be removed easily. And uh, this patient actually did pretty good after the vitrectomy. Now we can see the retina and That's the part. A small part is still left behind, but uh, I think uh, with time this goes off. Uh, so this was after the surgery and we did a little bit of laser as well. That is the spot where the ram bleeding happened and the patient actually improved to 612 and a pretty happy patient. Now this is a case where the submacular hemorrhage, you can say it's quite a large one and uh, seeing the OCT, it can be diagnosed as this is a case of a PCV, multiple PEDs, notched PEDs. So we planned for intervitreal TPA, pneumatic displacements with anti wager considering this as a case of a PCV. And uh, this happened to be uh, one of the leading cardiologist's wife, so I was a little bit apprehensive in taking this case for the subretinal TPA. So uh, let's see whether the intervitreal TPA, which is a less intervention, will be required. So vision was 660. But this patient actually did pretty well. After three weeks, you can see the hemorrhage has subsided pretty well and the vision has improved to 624. After two months, obviously, we had given uh, the loading dose of anti following the surgery as well. And after two months, it improved to 69. And three months, it was actually 66. The patient was pretty happy. So not necessarily at all the time we have to go for subretinal TPA. Intervitreal TPA does pretty well in many cases. Obviously, if it is a very large one, then we have to plan with a subretinal TPA. Like this case, there was no other option than subretinal TPA. You can see the huge uh, hemorrhage, subretinal hemorrhage. Generally, the dictum is if it's more than four this diameter, you go for the subretinal TPA, but it, it, it can vary and it, it, it's actually on the discretion of the surgeon's discretion whether it will go for a subretinal TPA or an intervitreal TPA. The good part, this patient had come pretty early. The reason I'm showing this that anything can happen after subretinal TPA because many cases they respond pretty good, but some cases uh, can have a lot of complications. So once we are through with the PVD and give TPA, TPA was injected with the gas tamponade. Now this patient was a outstation patient. Uh, he went back to his hometown and then when he came, uh, he came almost after three months. So what we saw is the subretinal hemorrhage is almost subsided entirely, but he presented with an retinal detachment inferiorly. Quite a stiff one actually. This was the scenario. You can see there was no 
hemorrhage almost almost the entire hemorrhage has gone uh, except for the posterior pole you can see a little bit of organized uh, hemorrhage but the retina was stiff inferior stiff retinal detachment maybe the hemorrhage has subsided but uh, there was a huge uh, subretinal hemorrhage uh, so we had to take this case and now treat it as an inferior RD and I had to do a retinectomy. It was absolutely stiff over there. But at least uh, this patient when came with a uh, huge subretinal hemorrhage, the vision was almost, uh, PL vision was there, perceptual light was there, but at least we could good give some ambulatory vision after this uh, settling the retina. and did silicon oil POC like so. Now, uh, coming to the last case, this was a quite a old submacular hemorrhage. Patient presented pretty late. Uh, we thought, okay, let us try. Patient was given an option that uh, generally if it is late, the results doesn't come well, uh, but we can try. So the patient was uh, agreed to it and uh, we did a vitrectomy for this patient. You can see the little bit of fresh hemorrhage, a little bit of hemorrhage is still, it is not organized, but the, but the middle part is already organized. In this case, we obviously didn't do within first two weeks, which has been generally advocated that you should take as early as possible preferably within first two weeks. Now as there was a large hemorrhage and organized one, we are given in a multiple place. But if it is, yeah. Now after this, uh, Procedure. Now this is three weeks after the PPV. I thought the macula has already will be there, but after three weeks after PPV, pneumatic displacement and subretinal RTP and anti -vager, there was you can see the size of the hemorrhage is reduced and the vision is improved a bit. After six weeks, it improved to five feet of vision. And after three months, actually, the hemorrhage totally gone. The subretinal organized hemorrhage are totally gone. But as expected, there was a macular hole formation. But this is like a late presentation of the macular hole. So there was further diminution of vision when the macular hole was formed. So we had to take this case for It's already vitrectomized eye. Now we had to treat the macular hole. Now again, you can see there is no hemorrhage. At now the all the organized hemorrhage has also gone. And did an inverse pill technique. You can see the hole is quite large. almost done. So, so this was the result after the macular hole surgery. At least the vision what it lost due to the macular hole formation it went back to 660. And now you can see there is no subretinal hemorrhage. So this is also one uh, complication of the subretinal TP. It, there can be macular hole formation, breakthrough hemorrhage already we have shown one case. So 
Underlying, treating the underlying pathology is very important. Whatever the cause is, if it is a RAM, you need to do the laser. PC, we need to treat with anti injections. So this needs to be taken care. And to conclude, yes, as a general approach to some macular uh, hemorrhage treatment, pneumatic displacement can be combined with intervitreal RTPA if there is no contraindication. But as I was uh, discussed it previously, like anti vegf is also, the monotherapy is also an option. So although some macular hemorrhage can be challenging to manage, reasonable visual outcome can be achieved with timely and appropriate intervention. Thank you. May I say something? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. Dr. Maiti. Basically, uh, the macular formation happened to your case it was basically very close to uh, yes the basically in both of your cases you have given injection within the arcade no, uh, the and first the case first uh, case first case i'm telling you the distribution of hemorrhage another thing on one thing is size of the hemorrhage number two is duration of hemorrhage number three the distribution of hemorrhage if three things are important people are talking about the size of the uh, hemorrhage as well and as thickness. duration and thickness some says yes or some says no but i should say distribution is also very important in your first case, the ideal case for giving subretinal TPA, but not within the arcade. You can given, you could have given uh, just beneath the inferior arcade. And second thing also, uh, second case, you are lucky that macaronal formation not happened uh, in, the, in your first case. But in your second case, it was very sticky situation because partially organized, partially yeah. uh, pressed. So that in that uh, situation, uh, in uh, that situation, lot of addition might be there. So the TPA immediately and the force, you had sudden, there is sudden increase in submacular volume. But that was the volume. only area the where the hemorrhage was there. No, submacular volume, sudden increase in submacular volume, and there was organized blood that was very, like, mm -hmm. there is a lot of discrepancies between the uh, tor, uh, adherence, adherence. It was uh, a mixture between organized yes, and, and fresh and uh, no, fresh hemorrhage. No, so I had expected this whole will f uh, happen the next uh, post-operative day, but yes, fortunately it happened after uh, three because months. Because of the <laughs> presence of blood that's giving some Maybe kind of temporary. It, it, it didn't yes. happen. Uh, yes. But when you saw that uh, some macular some hemorrhage there, so you just uh, place your uh, um, uh, soft tip cannula over the hole and try to aspirate a little bit of fluid. That so was that organized, uh, no? No, that means organized, okay. But you are not aspirating out the TPA. But you are just closing the margin of the macular hole because you are sure but you have seen the blowout has happened. So at that time, just you don't with wait the, for the, the macular formation the in the post op period. Just because it is my practical experience, in my one of my cases, I just did only just apposition of the whole margin that will close the hole. Yeah. Because you are giving the gas tamponade, soft tip, and mm -hmm. soft tip, soft tip cannula. Mm -hmm. And you are maintaining the prone position, the hole will be closed. O the Blood will be vanished and hole will be closed. The hole didn't form actually. They formed <laughs> pretty late. <laughs> pretty late. But the, you, know, you know, scan line was not going through the fovea. Uh, no, we actually did the. If you did the six uh, raster, ah, say raster, uh, raster scan. <laughs> yes, sir, it is uh, not that um, uncommon, sir. It is. Uh, it is. The problem happens if it is a large uh, hemorrhage. We can put it in the side away from the fovea. It's better to avoid uh, go as far as uh, from the phobia as possible. But in cases where there is in the concentrate in the posterior pole, you can't help it, no? Yes, but still you have to choose the area <laughs> because that's why we are uh, choosing in the significant more yeah. than fourth degree diameter uh, hemorrhage. So Next, treated by uh, hemorrhage. I'd like to invite Dr. Sanjay. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'll be presenting TPA where, when, and how I use it. Uh, how I, I, I use it intravitreal, subretinal, and recently I've tried supracoroidal in one one patient. When I use it, small submacular hemorrhages, uh, I give intravitreal, uh, then large submacular hemorrhages, hemorrhagic retinal detachments, supracoroidal hemorrhage, and subsilicon oil uh, pre-retinal hemorrhages. So small submacular sub hemorrhages, you just displace uh, using the intravitreal gas and TPA. This technique attempts to physically displace the submacular hemorrhage out of the fovea using expensile gas faster by liquefaction of the clotted blood using TPA. The 
The dose given is 50 micrograms. The procedure is performed under topical anesthesia and involves an intravitreal injection of 0 to point 0 point 3 to 0 0.4 ml of SF6. Most commonly I use SF6 and sometimes C3 appear. A face down positioning uh, is done for one to three days and it, the advantage is that it is you can do it in OPD and uh, there's a shorter displacement time. So this is one of the cases, there was a uh, macro aneurysm which has led uh, with to the hemorrhage in all the three layers and uh, this was given uh, this uh, intravitreal TPA and uh, uh, gas was given post operatively very s very fast the uh, action occurs very fast in in this type of uh, small submacular hemorrhages it, i was able to displace of the uh, hemorrhage and this is another patient uh, i uh, this was in fact was the first case uh, which i had treated of submacular hemorrhage with intravitreal injection and tpa so large submacular hemorrhage uh, which me with subretinal tpa uh, use the small 41 gauge macro cannula nowadays and this is uh, how i go about it so this was a large submacular hemorrhage And what we were discussing in the last uh, uh, case, this this is a common complication. Yeah, the So this is this was a case uh, of a large hemorrhagic retinal detachment. 
and uh, there was uh, it was uh, there was no breaks only this large uh, macular uh, hemorrhage uh, secondary to ipcv was seen and this patient i gave uh, intravitreal tpa uh, one day before i took him, took her up for surgery and uh, next day i drained the hemorrhage uh, externally not going inside and doing the vitrectomy and this is one the, the, the picture on the left side is one day post operative and the i was almost able to drain most of the blood in in this eye otherwise i have to go inside create a retina a large retinectomy and remove the blood so this case, this is another option uh, where a tpa can be used then for suprachoroidal hemorrhages this was a 56 years female two weeks post cataract surgery a suprachoroidal hemorrhage had occurred intraoperative the best corrected vision was plpr accurate uh, the patient also had a retinal detachment with giant retinal tear and retina was lying in the pupillary plane so we can't delay the surgery for more period than uh, this period two weeks although uh, two weeks is also good enough that uh, the clotted blood liquefies and you will get but precautionary i just chose to give a suprachoroidal tpa 24 hours prior to surgery and then took the patient up for surgery and uh, and this was the surgery that was performed So this is the uh, final post-operative uh, pictures of this patient. So I have done only one case in which I have used this suprachoroidal, but I feel it may be sometimes be useful when you can't wait for longer to a time like two weeks or three weeks in the presence of a uh, uh, retinal detachment or kissing choroidals, which may cause very uh, uh, PBR very soon. Rather than if we wait, we may even lose the case at that time. So in those cases, we it can be given a try. then sub silicon oil pre retinal hemorrhage again i've used in one case but i did not have a favorable outcome uh, actually i missed that the, there was still a little bit of detachment present uh, below uh, in in that patient and the the clot definitely got lysed but the blood went sub retinal and uh, through the open break which was present and it also scattered all around and retina could not be settled again thank you can i say something Like sure, sir. Please. Especially sir. submacular hemorrhage, you are, um, we should not remove the ILM just before uh, doing the intravitreal inter subretinal TPA, as uh, subretinal TPA sometimes cause this macular blowout, foveal blowout. So if you have the macular formation postoperative period or during the surgery, we, we have to sometimes do the inverted ILM flap technique. So if you don't have the ILM at that time, so uh, your macula will not be closed. So that is the. i think we should preserve that uh, this ilm as uh, just uh, yeah, as you are right the, the only thing is like uh, if this macular blowout occurs and there's a macular hole formation mm. it is very difficult to remove the ilm at that stage 
because uh, sometimes uh, there are air bubbles below and the uh, retina gets raised. It's very difficult actually at that very sitting you uh, if you do it, try to do it. That's, that's, uh, uh, yes, that's why. And, and in one of those cases. During, uh, during, uh, during surgery, during the uh, foveal blowout, you can just, yeah, just touch your, uh, this, this soft tip cannula, just overlying the macular hole to just oppose the hole margin. So if the fortunately hole is closed, that's good enough. If you are not closing uh, in the post-operative door, there is reopening of the macular hole, then you can even do the ILM surgery after the in post op period after two weeks yeah. when the most of the blood has gone. Because you should not remove, take, uh, take the subretinal TPA out uh, from the subretinal space as it will uh, act your, uh, it will not uh, serve your yes. primary purpose. Yes. So TPA, ILM, I think it should be preserved. Routinely, whatever, sir, yeah, what is your? I that was it a prophylactic removal or just because it is one so, so one thing was like if if the blood is multi-layered like there was a sub ILM blood then there was an intraretinal hemorrhage subretinal hemorrhage as in that mac macro aneurysm that case in, in pardon sir in the patient where you one patient the earlier one there was not there but actually there was such a large uh, <laughs> some macular hemorrhage I thought I'd better remove uh, the ILM uh, the question was in the first video you showed first video hmm? First video uh, you where you gave intravitreal TPA, so I would have done only pneumatic displacement and anterior without uh, the TPA. Yeah, intravitreal. Yeah, that's also an option. The other option is that we often forget that these patients, a uh, lot of them are ICCV patients. Yes, sir. A lot of them. So post-op, uh, you know, uh, recurrent ILA injections are required. Yes, sir. It's not that because we are doing a mechanical job only. We yes. remove the uh, blood and put the gas or pneumo displacement. But we often forget that you know these patients do require. Yeah, the underlying pathology needs to be taken care of uh, yes. post-operatively. So that I has have to a patient be. whom I ultimately injected oil, but with the oil also I keep giving. Yes. Uh, I want to say one more. Like uh, rather than ILEA, you can choose bullous river, because uh, ILEA is a like uh, the, the uh, molecule size is quite uh, large, and if you give uh, uh, this thing, I we I have done in one study and I've already sent for the like publication because I don't know whether it will be published or not if it is accepted by IGO. So the thing is uh, bronosumum is the smallest molecule and if you are injecting a vitrectomy diet it will penetrate so faster it will the uh, there, there will be no time for the wash out uh, from the vitreous cavity. So it will uh, it will go directly into the subretinal space within six hours. And ILM so peeling also helps in that also. Yes. <laughs> faster <That's> but it's <laughs> true true. But macular formation, if you <laughs> face in post operative, you don't have any tissue to close yeah. it. You have to choose the either anterior lens capsule or amniotic graft or autologous retinal graft, all these things. So, ILM is the basic thing for <laughs> to treat <laughs> macular, yeah. to close yeah. macular. Yeah. Yes. yes. Sorry, on the TPA, uh, you often require multiple places. You don't inject one yes. place. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, at times you have seen, uh, you know, it regurgitates out small fluid and then you do extra exchange it may be more risk coming out so do you think that we should inject more or because I have not done it but in my we see often see our videos uh, post op so I saw video you would it has regurgitated some yeah. amount does come yes. initially sir because there is no space there is uh, potentially where, where you are injecting the choroid is totally opposed to retina and you are not injecting in the area directly under the hemorrhage. You start somewhere away from it, and that that is the reason sometimes it just comes out and then it uh, creates a plane and goes inside. So the idea is to basically create a cleavage plane first, and once there is a cleavage plane formation, you will see less amount of regurgitation and more amount of uh, bu bubble formation with the kind of uh, injection. Uh, as as you keep injecting, the bubble formation rate increases, and there you you will see a lesser amount of regurgitation unless and until that bubble is fully stuck with a clot formation. In that case, you may see a slight amount of regurgitation. But even in that case, you may inject uh, slightly more drug because that regurgitation doesn't like negate the um, uh, dosages that we're trying to put in. Some people have described, you know, uh, uh, subretinal along with air, along with the uh, air bubble, and along with the Avastin also, yeah. everything, uh, cocktail kind of. Retinal cocktail of uh, anti vagev this thing because I vitrectomy is in most of the anti vagev will not work, apart from very few options. So you can uh, give even biosimilar anti vagev also. 
Avastin also, uh, or uh, the original drug also. So I have so used subretinal. Uh, yes, air. Cocktail, antivirin, yes. uh, subretinal PP, and air. But yes. sir, uh, in my practice, I have. So, but in so but in my limited practice of hundred injections that I have done in past three years, <laughs> no, sir, mm. uh, uh, sir, uh, that I uh, I haven't felt the need to make uh, uh, I mean inject air for a cleavage plane generation. I haven't felt the need. I mean, the its oh idea no, is. It's not the for the generation. Like I was explaining. Yeah. It uh, is for the like when you are giving TPA, TPA the blood will lysed. So lysed blood that means the RBC will It'll be gravitate down infinitely. And if you are injecting subretinal uh, air, that will, due to the buoyancy factor, it will go up, and it will the the gravity situation, the barbicide will go down. It will make the foveal area clearer. Yeah. So if the if distribution of hemorrhage is just uh, beyond the market, superior arcade, th this is the ideal situation. If you just injected the TP and antivirin, and after some time uh, subretinal is and the volume, 0 0.05 cc of this thing, you have to very restricted volume, that TPA. And 0.05 cc of anti.